Well, thank you for having us here tonight. It is great to be here with you. My name is Kathy Winant. My husband, Jim, and I live in Liberty Township with our four beautiful children, Abra, who is 20, Caden is 14, Emerson is 10, and Reese is eight. We also have two very energetic golden doodles, Ollie and Maple. I left the corporate world when we had our third child to spend more time at home and to work in the community. I have spent many years as a parent volunteer in the Lakota schools and also in local politics. Like many of you, I have watched through the years as our government has ignored the needs of Ohio's families and instead catered to lobbyists and special interests. Look, we live in a relatively prosperous area here, but families still worry about how to pay for childcare and save for college, how to save for retirement and pay for health insurance. Many double income families are just one job loss or one health care problem away from major crisis. That's a big load to bear. Our politicians take our taxpayer dollars and give us a little in return. I'm going to Columbus because the good old boy brand of politics as usual isn't working anymore. It's time for new leadership. I'm running for state representative because we need to do better. We've got to put people first and fix our broken school funding system, attract more good paying jobs to Ohio, and work to be sure that every family has a safe and vibrant community in which to live, play, and work. Look, these aren't Democratic or Republican ideals. These are issues that matter to everyday Ohioans. If we work together, we can compromise on policy without compromising on our values. We need representatives who are willing to put people over political parties and special interests. It is time for new leadership and fresh representation. I'm Kathy Winant, and I ask for your vote for state representative. Hi, my name is George Lang, and I would like to thank the chamber. Joe, you guys always not to cover off the ball. Appreciate you guys for hosting this. Mike, Miami University, appreciate what you do. Mike Pittman, everything you folks at uh, Cox, Ohio do, I'd like to thank the sponsor of this. And more importantly, I'd like to thank the most amazing person that I know, my beautiful wife, Debbie Lang. Uh, Debbie, you're a great business partner. You're the best mom I know. You're an amazing, amazing friend, and I'm so happy you're in my life when we took this political ride uh, about 20 years ago. We didn't know all the ups and downs, but thank you for being there for me. I really appreciate it. Look, I'm a business guy. Okay, I understand what it takes to make business thrive, and when business thrives, the communities within those business prosper. For the last 15 years, I've been a township trustee in Westchester, and we set out to make Westchester the most business-friendly community in Southwest Ohio. The only significant community, no earnings tax, no income tax, a kinder, friendlier zoning regulation. We're not better, smarter, faster than any other community around us, but a business can come here and make more money. And what's happened? Under my watch, we had over $4 billion of new investment, I'm sorry, almost $4 billion, and almost 40 million square feet of new commercial construction. We've become the top community in terms of median household income, lowest unemployment rate in the state, and we now have over 4,000 businesses that employ over 60,000 people. And we've been named by Money Magazine as one of the top communities in America for the last 12 years. What does that mean to our residents? 15 years ago, our carryover was 800,000. Today, it's over 30 million without one tax increase in our general fund. Show me another community that can do that. We set out to make Westchester the most business-friendly community in Ohio. Westchester has flourished. Our businesses have benefited. Our residences have benefited. My goal is to make Ohio the most business-friendly state in the nation. All right. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, we started with Kathy, so we'll go with George for the first question. Uh, George, we're gonna, the first topic here is going to be business development. And given the business growth in Westchester and Liberty Townships, what is your strategy for developing future business and addressing the increasing growth in our region? I'm glad you asked that question. And make no mistake about it, Westchester is the economic envy of the state of Ohio. What we have done in Westchester, leaders from communities all over the state meet with me and ask me, how'd you do it? 
This was not an accident. It was not an accident. The heart and soul of what happened in Westchester is the same heart and soul that's going to drive Ohio, the same heart and soul that's going to drive America. It's small businesses. Small businesses are the heart and soul of our community. With that in mind, I have launched a business first caucus in Ohio. Our goal is to make Ohio the most business friendly state in the nation. And right now we're a long way from that, but we used to be. We used to be the land of innovation, the land of manufacturing, the land of flight. Think of the Wright brothers. But in 1970, we implement the income tax along with one negative regulation after another. 1970, we have 24 congressmen. Today, we have 16 going to 15, probably 14 in the next census. So with this Business First Caucus, and I've got about 20 other reps that have signed on for it, our goal is to make Ohio more business friendly. To be that state where business looks at, where am I going to uh, locate? They say Ohio. Why? Because of EBITDA. They can come here and make more money. And why is that important? I see young people here today. I see Trey, RJ, Matt King, the, the future of America. Ohio has a brain drain. We have amazing schools, but as people graduate, they're going to other states to work. Why? Better economic opportunity elsewhere. Let's be that state that the young people, I see even younger people up there. Let's be that state that the young people, when they graduate from college, not only do they want to stay in Ohio, but let's be that state where they graduate from Indiana or New York, as my daughter just did and came back to Ohio. Let's be that state that students want to gravitate back to. Thank you, George. Kathy, you're up. Look, Mr. Lang likes to take credit for Westchester's economic prosperity. You know why Westchester is actually prosperous? Two things, good roads and good schools. The Union Center exit was a vital part of the growth and expansion of the economic opportunities here in the Westchester area. And frankly, that came to fruition years before Mr. Lang was even in office. This district has great schools, partially because of the funding that I fought for in 2013 when Lakota was in deep, in deep trouble. Mr. Lang was nowhere to be found. When I get to Columbus, I want to put good roads all around the state of Ohio and make sure that we fix good school funding so that we have good schools all around the state of Ohio, because that is how you increase prosperity and jobs. Look, we're small business owners. My husband and I know what it's like to worry about making payroll so that we can make sure that our, our employees have food to put on their families' tables as well. You know, it's important that in Ohio we keep taxes down for businesses and that we reduce cumbersome regulations, but it is more than that. Businesses need a vibrant Ohio with good roads and good schools and a culture of innovation. I want to go to Columbus and I will work with anyone to make Ohio a very business, business friendly state and to make it friendly for the employees who work there as well. Thank you very much. Can I have a rebuttal? Um, we, we'll, we can do a 30 second rebuttal. We'll give each a 30 second rebuttal. We're not going to have time for rebuttals for every question. Though. Perfect. Thank you. You know, Kathy says I'm not responsible for the success here. She's right. No politician is responsible for the success. You can give me credit for the amazing roads, the way we've managed the money, but the credit for the success of Westchester, as well as any community that's thriving, goes to the businesses and the developers and the residents that choose that place to grow. Look, it's the business and developers that invest their own time, their own talent, their own treasure to make their community better. She's right, I don't deserve the credit. These people deserve the credit. Give me the credit for creating an environment where they can excel. Thanks, George. Kathy, do you have a 30-second rebuttal? I do not. Okay. All right. Go down the line. All right. Great. So, um, <clears throat> With, uh, as our state representative, um, what, what are some key projects um, that you feel um, you would seek to get state funding with the capital budget? Uh, we've had a lot of success with the capital budget um, over the years. So, Ms. Wynant, you are first. You know, as Mr. Lang mentioned, Westchester was once again named one of Money Magazine's top 50 places to live in the United States. That's really amazing. This is a great community. 
You know, if you read in the article, the number one reason why this community is so great is because of the great schools. People want to live in communities that have the best schools. And when businesses look to move here, the number one question they ask, how are the schools? In 2013, I had to work on the Lakota levy to help save our school district with some very good people who are in the room tonight. We were losing our best teachers and our principals, and our school was in danger of losing the high quality education that we offer. You know, as I said, Trustee Lang didn't do anything to help, but I did. I supported that levy in 2013 because our broken school funding system puts the burden on local taxpayers. That's wrong. And if we don't do something, the same thing is going to happen again and again. I don't like levies. I want to go to Columbus to fix our broken school funding system and to provide property tax relief. That is my number one goal. I need your vote so I can go to Columbus and fix the system. Thank you. That wasn't the question that Mike asked. Mike, let me answer your question. Uh, in the last capital budget, my priorities were education. I brought hundreds of thousand dollars back for Butler Tech and Miami University. I can't take all the credit. Other Butler County reps and our senator helped, but I was part of the effort to lead education. Uh, going forward in the next biannual, biannual budget, my focus on the capital bill, in addition to be education, is going to be the Voice of America Museum. For those of you that don't know about it, uh, we inherited this amazing facility from the federal government about 25 years ago. And <clears throat> We are trying to make it so that it isn't a tax burden on the residents. Think about these old buildings. Look at Miami, look at the uh, Cincinnati Music Hall or the museum. You know, they just put, I believe, $700 million into these buildings, and in 15 years it won't be enough. Uh, that building, the VOA, the museum, is worth saving. To me, that is hallowed grounds. Some of the most sacred grounds, not only in Westchester, in Ohio. From there, the message of freedom, the message of liberty, the message of what our founders had envisioned was spread throughout the world during the Cold War, during World War II, and other times of conflict. So my focus, Mike, is going to be on education and on hopefully getting some funding to help VOA become sustainable so that they are operating 100% without any funding at all from Westchester. Thank you. Kathy, can you just take 30 seconds, of, if you have specific projects that you'd like to bring to, because the capital budget's a very specific budget. Well, uh, certainly Mr. Lang would have a little bit more experience than I would with that, but when I get to Columbus, I'll learn all kinds of things about the capital budget. Uh, I will tell you that I think one of the things that we need to do is, is to invest in infrastructure, uh, local infrastructure, and specifically broadband, and expanding that into more rural parts of the state so that we can bring more small business development into even the rural parts of the state. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I forgot who goes first this time. Uh, George. 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 Okay. <clears throat> I, I lose track. In these Make it a softball. Um, I want to flip, kind of flip it a little bit. You've talked about growth. Well, there, there are citizens also concerned with rapid growth and how quickly this place has changed. And I mean, living here the last 20 years, it's pretty obvious the difference. How, how do you support managing and sustaining that growth over a long period of time? How do we make sure we aren't just exploding along the I-75 corridor, but building long-term sustainable business that will be here, 15, 20, for these kids that you mentioned? Yeah, the, the key to that is as you spread your infrastructure, so the growth and development will follow it. Uh, Kathy spoke about broadband expansion. I was very glad to not only sponsor but to vote for two bills um, that recently passed. One was House Bill 478, which uh, empowered small stem cell, cell towers so we can get broadband to more communities in Ohio. And the other one, I forget the House Bill number, but it's the last mile um, work that we're doing with broadband. And, and the concept of that, as you get into more rural communities, uh, these communities don't have the money. The businesses can't afford to step up to spread broadband all the way out. We say that last mile in some communities, it may be the last 25 miles. So we as a government said, hey, this makes sense for us to step forward and help these communities develop that infrastructure so that they too can flourish and prosper as communities that are close to the infrastructure do. You know, if you think about it, 200 years ago, 
Uh, if you wanted to flourish, you had to be close to a river, right? That's why Cincinnati did well. Then all of a sudden, 50 years ago, it was the interstate. Uh, thank God for the work that the federal government did on that. And I believe the future infrastructure is going to be broadband and helping everybody to have access to that. And I'm proud to have worked on legislation in the state to get that done. Thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. Look, I will say one of the most important things that we can do to help manage our regional growth uh, would be to expand public transit in Ohio. We are strategically positioned here in this area, right along I-75, right in the Cincinnati-Dayton corridor. It is the area where our growth is expanding and booming in a big way. And you know what? We are passed over by major businesses throughout the United States who could look to come here because we do not have appropriate public transit to get people to work. I am fortunate to represent Butler County on the Southwest Ohio Regional Transit Authority Board just since February, so I have a lot to learn there. Uh, and I will tell you that I've been surprised to learn just how drastically Ohio underfunds regional transit and public transit. You know, we don't need to, we don't need to talk about burdening property, burdening uh, taxpayers, but I'll tell you what, if we can partner with our businesses, partner with our stakeholders, and figure out what the best way would be to get people around the region so that we can strategically grow and manage our growth, that would be a good thing. You know, I talk about people over politics. I think it's really important to work with stakeholders and people that have a dog in the fight, so to say, and to not worry so much about what your political party might say or your special interests or your donors, but actually to get out there and to talk to the people who have a vested interest in the region and in bringing jobs here. And I think you'll hear from a lot of folks that public transit is critical. Thank you. All right, we're going to shift focus here to the opioid crisis. George, we're going to start with you. Be Kathy. I'm sorry, Kathy, we're going to see this is why I can't be in charge of these Me things. Too. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah. I got to track that. Yeah, thanks, Thank Mike. You. Um, Kathy, we'll start with you. So depending upon what polls you look at, uh, and, and really all of them show Ohio being near the top uh, as far as being the worst state for the op opioid crisis. Butler County ranks number five in the state of Ohio in terms of overdose deaths. What will you do as a state representative to combat that problem? Look, this is very personal to me. I have a very close family member who is an opioid addict to this day. Uh, Narcan saved his life just last year. It's easy to cast judgment unless you know someone in crisis. This is a complex problem without an easy solution. And I will tell you, we need to look around at other areas and how they're battling this crisis and see what works. It's going to take a comprehensive solution. And that means we need affordable and accessible treatment. Do you know how hard it is to get effective treatment unless you have a court order or a lot of money. It's difficult to get treatment. You know, Ohio's government can work with local governments and regional partners to expand access to treatment and to expand access to mental health therapy. There are so many things that need to happen. Families need additional support. First responders need support. If we work together, and we put people over politics in special interests, we can solve the very problems like the opioid addiction and help to save lives and further enrich families. Thanks, Kathy. George, question to you. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Uh, I, Kathy, I can appreciate what uh, you've been through. Uh, Dave and I have some dear friends whose uh, children have been fighting mm -hmm. that as well. And it, it's at all socioeconomic levels. Listen, here's how serious the problem is. If you look at deaths per 100,000 due to heroin overdoses, Ohio, number two state in the nation, number two, second only to West Virginia. Butler County, I'm sorry to correct you, Lee, we are now number three county in Ohio. Uh, first is Montgomery County, second is uh, Brown or Adams, I believe it's Brown, then Butler County. So it's a serious issue, and if you look at the chart of deaths, you don't see a whole lot in our district, but within our county, it's a serious problem. What's the answer? Uh, I think one of the things Kathy said is right. We have to figure out ways to come up with treatment over incarceration for users. Um, 
Not only is the cost of incarceration, and, and by the way, it's my party that is saying we can't afford treatment. I'm calling BS. Not only is the cost of treatment long term cheaper than the cost of incarceration, if we treat somebody and get them whole and get them productive, guess what? Rather than sucking taxes out of the system to incarcerate them, they are productive and they're putting money into the system. So treatment has to be one of the things we have to do. Then we have to really figure out the root cause. And I wish I could tell you I knew what it is. Uh, I can tell you when I had my bone attached hearing aid, my doc said, I'm going to give you five um, opioids. You may, not, you may not need them, but if you need them, take them. Uh, the prescription was filled for 30. And I got home, and my wife will tell you I didn't even need an aspirin. Yeah, it was annoying, but it never got to a level of pain. So th there is a problem with people over-prescribing drugs, and I believe part of that is government mandates. Government are forcing docs to over-prescribe, and now governments are saying, wait a minute, uh, look what we're doing. That's why you have to be careful of any government regulation, always the law of unintended consequences. All right, we're going to stay on the topic topic of overdo overdoses or um, opioids, but specifically addiction. Um, we've, I, we at the Journal News have been working on an opioid series and an addiction series uh, for this month. Um, and I've talked to a lot of lawmakers over the past month. Um, and I, Jim Butler, representative up, up at Oakwood, he says that we have an addiction problem. It's, it's more than just opioids, it's more than just heroin, it's, it's that underlying problem is addiction. Um, and, and he also said that we need a comprehensive solution as well as other lawmakers said that we need something to be more proactive. Uh, mental health, addiction services, education and so forth. Butler County's had over a thousand overdose deaths since 2012 as of July of this year and about 72 percent of those are because of heroin and op opioids. So. The question is, how do you address this underlying problem of addiction? Yeah. Mike, if I could, uh, if I knew the answer, I wouldn't be running for state representative. Uh, the, the problem is many fold. You know, we, we look at the people that are addicted, but it really hasn't changed much since 1913. 1913, all drugs were legal. You could go to your local hypothecary, get marijuana, you could get cocaine, you could get heroin. Federal government did a study and found out 1.3% of Americans were addicted to drugs. So in 1914, they made those drugs illegal. 1970, they do another study. By the way, this is all, you can find all these stats at the website LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. These are a group of police officers that are against illegal drugs. 1970, Congress does another study. They discover 1.3% of Americans are now addicted to illegal drugs. So they made the laws tougher, three strikes and you're out, on and on. In 2010, Congress does another study, and guess what? 1.3% of Americans are still addicted. So my thought is we keep punishing those that are addicted rather than trying to help them. I think the key to this is treatment. Let's get these people off of being addicted. Let's still go after the drug dealers. Let's still stop them. We have to stop locking up people that we're pissed off at and focus on locking up people that we're afraid of. And I, I believe the, the key to this, Mike, is uh, treatment, uh, helping people to get better. And by the way, the reason the deaths have spiked so much in the last few years isn't because there's more people addicted. It's because the stuff that is on the street is more deadly. Kathy? I would agree with you, Representative Lang. I think it's really important to uh, crack down on the, the drugs that are coming into our area. The quality of, of the drugs is just intense. I mean, a lot of folks who try things for the first time are hooked, and it doesn't take long uh, before we know what happens from then. Uh, I will tell you that the Medicaid expansion in Ohio has been a really valuable tool in battling addiction and the opioid crisis. Despite what one might think about Medicaid, right, it's really important, I think, to preserve this until there is a better solution. You know, there are a lot of underlying mental health concerns. And again, as George said, I would agree. If I knew the answers to all this, I wouldn't be where I am either. I'd be making a whole lot of money doing something else, right? Um, but look, the Medicaid expansion strengthens our options to treatments, right? Uh, and, but we also need to provide follow-up care. 
and long-term extended care. And the research shows that to treat this addiction, it takes a medication-assisted treatment. And then you've got to think about the families that need supports. I mean, regardless of what happens, if the, if the person survives or overdoses and leaves us, there are often children involved. Our job and family services are overburdened. Our schools are trying to pick up the slack and help. We've got families that need additional support, and this is a huge concern. I mean, it is, when I say a comprehensive approach, it is really going to take looking at the entire system, the entire healthcare system, up and down to figure out what we can do together. And this isn't a partisan issue at all. I agree with you there. Do I have a follow-up to that? Or? All right, we're gonna shift gears again, because you guys are doing well, we're shifting here. <laughs> And this is a pretty broad question as the academic, I guess I get to, and we're shifting to education. And my question is, what's the appropriate relationship between state government and local educators, local school districts? Kathy. I'm sorry, Mark, you say question? What's the appropriate relationship between state government and local school districts? And I think Kathy's up. Yes. Yeah. So this is a, this is a great question, and uh, well, I you. think one that we've got to really go. consider. Uh, the state government is, tasked by the Ohio Constitution to provide a thorough and effective, uh, a thorough and efficient uh, system of education in Ohio. And so that means the funding solution really rests on the state shoulders. We have had a funding problem for decades. And in fact, only probably one time since uh, the 1930s has the state paid at least half of the cost of educating a student. Uh, local school boards Ha, are tasked with just determining when to run property tax levies and how much to run uh, and how much how to make up that balance of what the funding ought to be on the local level. And you know what? Tax levies, it makes it hard for school districts to budget over the long term, right? Not only are property taxes burdensome on homeowners, but it's also really burdensome on school districts. To plan years into the future, you create boom and bust levy cycles. Uh, so, so the state really needs to take a look at what it costs to educate a student and create a sustainable for funding formula around that. The other piece is when we have, we've got these report cards and when we've got these districts that are struggling, currently we have, as a result of House Bill 70, the takeover plan where the state comes in and takes over a struggling school. You know what? I believe in local control. I think that the state should not be doing that. Instead. They ought to work with the local school boards and the local communities and stakeholders to figure out why these schools are struggling and figure out how they can improve that situation together. George. Thanks, Kathy. You know, as a strong believer in the Constitution, I believe the more decisions we can push down to the local level, the better off we are. So I believe the state school board should work at making themselves less significant and making the local school districts more significant. And I'm glad Kathy brought up the uh, school report cards. I've been working very hard on this. Our school report card system right now is so unfair, and it's unfair to both urban districts as well as suburban districts. And I've recently had a meeting with about six to eight local school districts in Southwest Ohio to address this. I've co-sponsored some legislation by Chairman Mike Duffy and Mike has asked me to take the lead next year in January if this legislation doesn't get passed this, uh, this, this year. Let me just tell you one thing where the state report cards fail school. One of the measures in the, hang on, I want to make sure I get this exactly right, pre preparing for success component, component of the report cards. One of the things schools are measured against. One of the measures in there is how many of your students have taken the ACT test. I'm sorry, not all kids want to go to college. Matter of fact, I think one of the disservices we do to kids today is push them toward college. So some kids want to go to the military. Some kids want to go straight to work. Guess what? If you don't take your ACT, your school gets a zero for every student that doesn't take the ACT. We are unfairly punishing schools that are having people ready to join the workforce but not go to college, and that has to stop. Can I just add something to that, Ro? Sure, we'll give you a 30-second rebuttal. That's fine. 
Yeah, so it's really not a rebuttal, but it's just something else to add on to your comment about the state report cards. Uh, I will tell you that one of the, really the obvious thing to me that the, the report card highlights is the discrepancy in wealth around the districts around the state of Ohio. You know, and this harkens back to the school funding problem that we have. You know, you can't have a wealthy district like a Lakota or a Mason and then 10 miles down the road from here, you have a district like New Miami, right? Where 100% of their kids are disadvantaged according to the Ohio Department of Education. And we fund those schools the same. I have a quick follow-up, if you could. Uh, you mentioned the burdens from property tax. Yes. If not property taxes, then what? How do we fund our schools? Right. Well, I don't know that we could ever make property taxes go completely away, okay. but I will say that one of my goals is to reduce the over-reliance on property taxes. That's one of the reasons that the state Supreme Court has declared our school funding model unconstitutional four times since 1997, but we, it's so complex we haven't been able to solve that problem. But like I said, I think that if we do an evidence-based model and we take a look around and we figure out what it really costs to educate a student uh, and we build an equitable and sustainable funding model around that, then you know we can work together at the state level to put those pieces together and make sure that we reduce the over-reliance on property taxes. I think that was a full question, not 30 seconds. <laughs> no, this is a follow-up question. We'll give you, we'll yeah. give you a chance. No, that was no, 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 that no. was just a follow up to just the follow up. And you, yeah. have, you have the same chance to respond. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, the question was, if not property taxes. Can you repeat taxes, the question again? Pardon me. Can yeah. you repeat the question? Sure. If, if she said property taxes are burdensome, if we don't yeah. use property taxes, what then do we? That's the question, right? What Got do we it. shift it to? Yeah. So the one thing I like about property taxes, <clears throat> the only way you can increase them is go to the voters and ask the voters' permission. Let the voters say you've done a good job and you deserve more money. Anytime I hear somebody talking about new taxes or new way of funding, it scares me. I, I look at what our own governor, John Kasich, did to eliminate the tax on, local, on small businesses. He didn't decrease the size of government like we did in Westchester. All he did was a tax shift. He increased taxes on other businesses in order to decrease that tax. So anytime I hear new funding sources, the uh, hair on the back of my neck goes up. Thank you. All right, George, and you kind of have a, a perfect lead in for me. Mark's question, uh, the first question was, what's the relationship between the government and educators? My question is, what should the relationship be between uh, the school districts and businesses? I'm glad you asked that. Um, I talked earlier about the Business First Caucus that I've started. There's four pillars of the Business First Caucus. One of those pillars is workforce development. Look. Ten years ago in Ohio, we had so many jobs available. Um, I'm sorry, we had so many people ready to go to work, but no jobs that are available. Now we have just the opposite problem because uh, we have kids that aren't ready to go into certain areas. Uh, for example, you know, I, I think we push college way too much. Guilty. My wife and I have two beautiful daughters. We push them both into college. One flourished in college. The other. She wanted to be an actress. College did not benefit her at all, or I shouldn't say not at all, but it was very insignificant. We did her a huge disservice. We paid for everything and we encouraged her to go. So the relationship between schools and business is key. I know in Westchester, we started some internships to uh, get businesses and schools together. We've gotten Butler Tech together with our businesses and businesses that are thinking about coming to Westchester so they can work on curriculum so that when kids graduate from Butler Tech, they're ready to go to work. Uh, one of the four pillars is workforce development and having kids when they come out of school ready to do one of three things. In my opinion, they need to be ready to go to college, join the military or go to a job, whatever they prefer. Or this is America. If they want to be a bum, they have the power to do that as well. But I think our schools should focus on those three things. And business are critical in two of those three things. All right, Kathy, you're up. Yeah, uh, George mentioned the uh, partnership between Lakota and a lot of our local businesses around here. And I think that's a great thing that, that we've been doing, uh, the partnership with, for instance, Westchester Hospital uh, and, and some of these other through the chamber uh, gives 
kids a really great chance to be exposed to new career opportunities and avenues that they might not have already had. And I think a lot of this new career readiness programming is great. You know, we also need to partner with businesses and labor organizations to expand job training and apprenticeship programs. You know, we hear all about the skills gap all the time, right? There are skilled jobs ready without workers to take those jobs. We need people to build bridges. We need people to, to run electric for corporations. We need people to do these jobs. These are good paying jobs. You know, I was down uh, at the iron workers in Kentucky a few weeks back, and I will tell you what, they have an impressive uh, apprenticeship program. It takes about four years and it makes me feel good as someone who doesn't like bridges. It takes about four years for them to go through all of their training and be able to work efficiently in a, uh, on a bridge. By the time they finish that, if they just want to take a couple courses over at their local community college, they have a bachelor's degree. And then they finish and they start work at $90,000 a year. And they have great benefits. That's really amazing. This is one of those ways that we can partner with business and labor organizations to prepare kids for a successful future. 10 second rebuttal, actually not a rebuttal, but we'll, we'll give you 30 seconds. Go I only need 10. Uh, I agree with everything Kathy said, all of those things we need to look at. And Lakota has done a really good job as has Butler Tech. I know I see former school board member Joan Powell. I know Matt Miller's here. I saw Todd Parnell, Linda O'Connor, all leaders of the school district. Uh, these people are doing a, a, as good a job as they can to make sure our students are ready and prepared. All right, we're staying on schools, but we're shifting a little bit here. Um, we've got a lot of questions. Well, if you see right here, we got a lot of questions from a lot of areas, but we got about seven or eight questions here on school and gun safety. So obviously you've, everybody, if you live in Butler County, you know Sheriff Jones, his position on wanting uh, teachers or, or staff armed in the schools. Um, we have the school safety tax. So just a general question, what is your position on guns in the schools and, and how do you fix school safety to make sure schools are safe? And I think we are on Kathy up now. Yeah, so wow, as a parent of four kids, three of whom are still in Lakota and one's at Ohio State, this is what keeps me up at night, school shootings. Well, that and debates, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm also a gun owner, and I support the Second Amendment. There is no easy answer, but I don't support arming teachers. What I do support is the state working with local school boards to implement what works best in their districts to keep their buildings safe, like a well-trained officer in every building, such as Lakota has done. But we also need to support students who are feeling isolated or who are struggling and make sure that we have the resources there. Many school districts are incorporating wraparound programs with mental health uh, therapy and treatments there. Uh, you know, we need representatives who don't have a vested interest in the gun industry, to be frank, because we need representatives who are willing to put people over politics and special interests to find common sense solutions to prevent gun violence like increasing and expanding our background checks and closing the gun show loophole. You know, most Ohioans favor those things. If we work together and put people over political parties and special interests, we can work together and figure out how to solve the issue of violence in school. Mr. Lang. I do support, in certain circumstances, arming school personnel. Every time I talk about this question, I. I can't get this image out of my head. It's not an image I saw, but it's an image of the story I was told when Sandy Hook happened. That principal, remember? She loved her students so much. When she saw the armed gun guy, armed asshole, I'll call him, at the end of the hallway, she went running at him with nothing more than a shoe to throw to stop. Obviously, she was a quick and instant victim. But what if? What if she was armed? What if she was able to take cover? Because this happened early on in the incident. What if she was able to stop him? Think of all the lives that would be, kids that would be alive today. The carnage that society would have been spared and all of the, the, the stuff that those families are going through. 
You know, I look at what happened on September 11th when those heartless, faceless, cowardly bastards took their planes and rammed them into our buildings, killing our moms, our dads, our grandmas and granddaddies, our sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters. What did the airlines do? They started the federal deck program for pilots, pilots that went through very stringent and comprehensive training were now allowed to carry a gun. What are the results? We haven't had a September 11th since 2001. Think of the psychology of these people that are shooting up. They're looking for soft targets. The airline said our passengers are precious enough that we're willing to take that chance. I think our students, the future of our country is precious enough that it's worthwhile at least taking the chance and see what happens. Could I have a quick response to that? Yeah, go ahead, 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there, George. I definitely think that, you know, I could get behind something like, uh, like an air marshal model for sure. Uh, what I can't get behind is a concealed carry, a teacher with a concealed carry. I have my concealed carry license and an eight hour class and a few hours on the range is not enough training to prepare someone for that horrible, unthinkable incident. I can just tell you a little anecdote from my class. Uh, there was a woman in there, you know, with her firearm on the range, and she's supposed to hold it straight down the range, but she's looking over at us asking questions, and she passed. Can I rebut? R so, real quick, real quick, real quick. So I, I think Kathy's right on that. What the federal aviators did, the airlines, they made the training so stringent and so comprehensive and currently FASTER offers a program. It takes years to get through it for teachers at no cost whatsoever. But in my opinion, nobody should be allowed to carry in a school if all they have is their concealed carry permit. The training needs to be stringent. Kathy, you're right. And just a real quick question, I just want a yes or no. Do you support the school safety tax that's coming up in November, yes or no? Kathy? I don't know enough about it. I apologize. Okay. Mr. Lane? I don't think we get to vote on it since Lakota opted out. All right. Two politicians with answers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, if, if, if I had the chance to vote for it, uh, I would probably vote no. So I think we're back to me. And who's up next on our list? That's correct. Hey, George, yep. yep. We're getting down to the end here, so. Yeah, we got about um, 10 minutes left before we have to close it. Right we'll shift gears to a little more positive, I think. What can a state representative do? We talked about education, this thing, you know, the employment skill gap. And you talked about trade schools. and all this. What can you do as a state rep to support policies, programs that we close, whether it's college, whether it's trade school, how, how do you do that as a state rep? What do you see the, the role of the state in, in closing that? If you want Ohioans to stay here, we have to prepare them to work here. How do we do that? What's that? Employment skill gap. Employment skills. employment skills. Yeah, employers say we don't have people that know how to work here. We can't hire them. Yeah, you know, I think we've talked about this before. And as I said, one of the four pillars mm -hmm. is workforce development. So there's a whole lot of different things that looks like. Right now, we don't have enough workers to fill the jobs. Well, there are many people that I tend to agree with. We come up with a treatment program for users in jails. And while they're in the treatment program, let's get them trained to be productive citizens uh, we have 49,000 people in American j in Ohio jails costing Ohioans over $2 billion a year. I don't know that we have a workforce development issue. We have an allocation of assets issue. Ohio, I'm sorry, America has more people in jail than communist China. They have, what, 2 billion residents? We have 350 million? We have more people in American jails than all 36 unions of the European Union, I'm sorry, all of the nations of the European Union combined. Are Americans really that much worse than the rest of the world? I don't think so. I think we tend to be better. So Mark, I think one of the keys to your question is we've got a workforce. We just have to treat them and train them. Uh, yeah, it's gonna cost money, well, that's but in the long term, it's gonna save the taxpayers an incredible amount of money when we can take someone off of being a burden on the tax system to being a producer for the tax system. Kathy. Well, we seem to agree on a lot. 
I, I really agree with you on that, uh, George. I think it's important that we do consider that we have a workforce development opportunity uh, with people that we are imprisoning for things we probably don't need to have them in prison for. And you're right, we have lost over a half a million working people from the state of Ohio in the last 10 years, and that's one of the reasons our tax base is shrinking. Uh, you know, I think as a state legislator, part of your role is to serve as an ambassador to your community and to, and to the state, really, and to build networks and relationships with businesses and other stakeholders and labor unions and all over the place uh, so that you can identify where those opportunities are to create new job training programs and, and apprenticeship programs. Uh, you know, you talk about the skills gap. Uh, look. It's absolutely important that we train highly skilled workers to be prepared for the jobs of the future. We are very technology based and that is going to be critical. But we are also looking at construction jobs where we need well-trained employees to work there. And these places, these employers are paying very well and providing good benefits. And as a state legislator, when you build those relationships and you partner, you can do these things without costing taxpayers any dollars. You just create new opportunities and innovation. That's how I think we can, if we work together, we can expand those opportunities. It's the George and of, Kathy show. It's the first high five I've seen. So well done. <laughs> All right, uh, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up here. So, um, Kathy, this one's going to go to you. Sure. What, what is your economic vision for the citizens in the 52nd House District? Boy, we're doing pretty well as it is. I think the citizens of the 52nd House District, we are, I think, the second most prosperous district in the state. Uh, so I think we need to continue and expand on that. You know, we've, we still have quite a few folks who are living in poverty, and I think it might come as a surprise to some people in this room that about 20% of Lakota's kids are considered uh, 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 in need, for lack of a better word, from the state of uh, Ohio Department of Education, and 40% of Fairfield's kids are as well. You know, we've got to make sure that we are bringing good-paying jobs to all of Ohio and to this district, right? And that includes uh, partnering with uh, regional opportunities um, and bringing uh, transit here uh, and making our community as vibrant as possible because people want to live in good communities and businesses want to come where their people want to live. George, you're up. Kathy's right. Uh, our district is the second most prosperous district. Our average median household income is about, it's less, than $50 away from being number one. And I'm convinced if our three townships stay on the track we're on, we are gonna make it number one. So we still, however, have a poverty problem. We have pockets in Westchester, Fairfield, and Liberty of deep poverty. And, and a lot of people like to say, you know, we have racial issues in America. I, I don't believe that. I believe we have poverty issues in America. Poverty breeds insanity. It breeds low self-esteem. It breeds promiscuity. It breeds criminality. It, it is a poverty issue. And we must continue to do better to address the poverty issue. Anybody here that understands the laws of supply and demand, you know why poverty, although it's still in our district, is very small because we have put business first and increased jobs and the laws of supply and demand say as you increase demand, uh, wages will go up so people are more prosperous. But we can do more. We can take the Ohio model, the Westchester model to Ohio. Let me just read the mission statement from our Business First uh, Caucus that I started. I wrote this and all of the members agreed to this. We believe a state cannot thrive without a strong business presence. We, the Business First Caucus, exist to promote, advance, and protect business interest and entrepreneurship by eliminating barriers for expansion and job creation. Our mission is to make Ohio the most prosperous state in the nation by making Ohio the most business friendly state in America to inspire companies to do great things and to financially dominate the other states. Steve, it's my hope when your son is finished with his NFL kicking career that he's gonna come back in Ohio and uh, there's gonna be an opportunity for him to do whatever he wants to do to be whatever he wants to be. All right. And just to clarify, there is a school district in the 52nd 
Fairfield Township's part of it, the Fairfield School District, they are voting on that safety tax, so. Yeah. All right, um, we, we are gonna end up here more of a, kind of a what's your role type of question here. Um, so what, what is the role and the relationship um, in building bri bridges and partnerships with our North neighbors like Warren County as a state representative? And what is your role as a state representative to um, work with across the aisle? Because Kathy, if you are elected, you're gonna be in the minority. George, you'll be in, you, re you will remain in the ma uh, majority, but you still have to work across the aisle to get some stuff done. Well, absolutely. I will tell you, you know, my campaign motto is people over politics. And I believe that with everything I have, that it's important to put uh, political parties and special interests aside and work on building relationships, not only with your colleagues across the aisle, on your same side of the aisle, but also outside of the state house and outside of the organization that you're with and with a variety of other community organizations and neighboring groups and neighboring communities. Because when you do that, you're putting the people first. You're uncovering what the needs are in these communities and you're also figuring out ways that you can be innovative and partner to solve the problems together. You know, it's really, really important that we move past partisan labels and we move past which side we're on and how we believe and all of that and figure out what is important to the people. How can we come together, both in the state house and local communities, local counties, to make our areas more prosperous, to bring more folks out of poverty, to strengthen our education and to make our area more vibrant. I think everyone in this room can agree the discourse in America, the political discourse in America, it is an all time low. Anybody disagree with that? The hypocrisy on the left and the hypocrisy on the right, both parties are guilty of this. It is at an all time low. I'm, I'm so glad, first time I met Kathy, about two or three weeks ago, campaigning at a football game, by the way, I was hoping she wasn't there, but she was. Uh, we made. <laughs> We made a commitment to run a powerful, positive campaign and to show and explain to everybody where we stand on the issues and not get down in the mud and not make it personal. And Kathy, you have not only my word that I will do that, you have my word that I will not allow my supporters to do that as well. So it's a great question. What do you do to work across the aisle? Well, the first thing, one of the key things you do is you find common ground with people from the other party. By the way, I got sworn in September 13th of last year. I was up there my second week. Not one Republican came down and, and offered to buy me lunch. First one to buy me lunch, Bridget Kelly, a Democrat from Hamilton County. By the way, we had a wonderful lunch, disagreed on everything we talked about, but she's a, uh, a beautiful being and I think very highly of her. But you have to find areas where you have common ground. So there's another uh, Democrat named Dan Ramos who's a Latino. By the way, George Lang is not my birth name. I was born George Fabian Fajardo. So I'm one of only three Latinos in the state house. So Dan and I partnered on some legislation to recognize Latinos. I ran into Janice Boyd, who like myself, grew up their formidable years in foster care. I believe Janice, Janice and I are the only two legislators that spend our early years in foster care. And as a result of that, she and I are partnering to make some, uh, we have co-sponsored legislation to try to fix some of the things that are wrong in the foster care system. You'd be surprised, Kathy and I have agreed on a lot of things tonight. Mike, you'd be surprised how much you agree with people on the other side. Just to, to end the, this, in the name of civility, in the name of good fun, please say something kind or something you admire about your opponent. Wow, um, there are a lot of things I will say that from the first moment that I met George, he's been very outgoing and friendly. Um, and, you know, every time I see him from now on, he gives me a nice warm hug. And I just truly feel like, look, we have a bet going. Well, it's not really a bet. It's a promise that when this is over, what is it, the winner or the loser? Do you remember? I think the winner buys the drinks. I don't the know. winner buys a cocktail. <laughs> yeah. We're going out one way or another. So, so this is not, you know, animosity. We have um, disagreements on some things and different ways as, as to uh, how we should reach goals. But, but uh it's good. Yeah. So I, I can say a lot of great things about Kathy. She's beautiful. She's friendly. She's nice. Much cuter than I am. Anybody disagree? Perfect. That's unanimous. Um, 
But what I really appreciate about Kathy is how she has inspired her supporters. Look at you guys here. This is in a seat that she probably is, is way behind, but she is working hard. She's inspired an army of people to go out there and work for her. And anybody that has that kind of charisma that can get people to follow her, uh, you're doing something right. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanson. Okay, I guess that's my cue. Closing statements? Yeah, yeah, closing statements. Oh. Yeah, yeah, go we'll ahead. A minute each, and I think. Go ahead, closing uh, statements from, yeah, go ahead. I think I go first because you went first. Okay. Yes. Um, so as I said earlier, I'm one of only three Latinos. I was born George Fabian Fajardo. My mama had me one month after she turned 23 years old. My older sister, eight years my senior, almost eight years. You can do the math. Shortly after I'm born, my paternal father, who's just a kid himself, takes off. My mom is left with five kids, three of us in diapers, no education, no job skills, no marketable skills. Shortly after that, she has a nervous breakdown, and I become a ward of the state. And I spent my early years in foster care. And one of the things I've learned, one of the things I've tried to inspire, it's why I love seeing all the young people here, it's not where you start that counts, it's where you finish. And I've learned to believe in the power of the individual, not the power of the collective. And I believe that's what our founding fathers had in mind when they created America, a community where the individual was more important. If you agree with me and you feel that we are overtaxed, overburdened, overgoverned, and overregulated, I humbly ask for your vote in November. Thank, Thank you. you. Kathy? We have knocked on thousands of doors and talked with countless people. And I will tell you, they are tired of polarization. They're tired of finger pointing and negativity. And frankly, they're tired of politics as usual. Voters have a choice this fall. It's one between the same old politics of polarization or a brand new leadership that brings people together in common cause to get things done. We need representatives who will work for the hardworking families in Ohio. I'm running for state representative because I believe in the fair representation and because we deserve thoughtful and collaborative leadership that puts families and communities first. A good leader is mindful of the fact that they are not elected to represent their political party or their special interests or donors or even their friends. They should be mindful of the fact that they are elected to represent everyone in their district, even those who disagree with them. I look forward to a future when we're working together and we are past petty divisions. It is time to rise above partisan labels and focus on our shared values. I'm Kathy Wynett and I ask for your vote for state representative. Thank you very much. Let's give them another Ladies round. and gentlemen, what do you think, huh?